Hi, Stock Centeno, and thanks so much for joining us today. You've got the power. Uh, interesting topic today. We're going to talk about the suboccipital muscles and how they impact patients with upper neck issues, craniocervical instability. Uh, in addition to that, uh, how they are important in headache generation and may also be important in things like imbalance, dizziness, uh, vertigo, et cetera. So as usual, we'll talk about that topic. I'll give a short presentation uh, and then we'll take questions. You can ask questions about that topic or about anything else. Uh, if you're just joining us, focus today is the suboccipital muscles and how they play a role in craniocervical instability and in some of the symptom generation with craniocervical instability. So uh, let's get to sharing my screen and we'll get moving in that direction here. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and play this and we'll get started from the top. So we're talking about the role of the subaccipital muscles in craniocervical instability or CCI. So the upper cervical spine has a ball being balanced on the end of a stick control problem. And what I mean by that is that we have this ball at the end of the stick and the ball obviously is uh, the head and, oh, still getting those. I, ah, I tested this before that wasn't happening. Well, anyway, we have a ball at the end of the stick and that ball could fall off in any number of directions. And so there's a control issue of how you control the, uh, the ball at the end of the stick. Now, uh, one of the ways that the body keeps the head stable from an active standpoint on top of the spine is there are lots of small muscles heading in lots of different directions, and those are called the suboccipital muscles. For example, if the head wants to tilt right, you can activate the left correctly vectored muscles, meaning the muscles that can counteract that, and that can counteract that motion. So as you can see, the small muscles are involved in that head stability or that ball at the end of the stick phenomenon. Now, some of these muscles go between C0 and C1, so they're going to control that motion between C0 and C1. Some of these muscles go between C1 and C2, so they're going to control that C1, C2 motion. And some of these muscles go from C0 to the axis, uh, meaning they cross two levels, so they're going to control more uh, that entire block of uh, joints. Now, you can certainly bet that if there's any instability from a ligamentous standpoint at any of these levels, the corresponding muscles are going to jump in there and spasm and try to help that instability. And one of the critical things to understand about these muscles is they have a secondary function, and that's proprioception. Uh, and what that means is that they've got a higher concentration of muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. These are little sensors within those muscles that help to determine what your head position is on your neck. And that information has to get coordinated with visual information coming in from your eyes and the inner ear information coming in through your ears in order for you to have normal balance. So if you mess with these muscles, they can give bad information about that head position, which can cause imbalance, dizziness, et cetera. What's also unique about this area is you've got these occipital nerves, which I show here in yellow, that snake through this muscle complex. And it's the snaking through that muscle complex that can cause problems. Uh, for instance, if you've got spasm in these small muscles, then as seen there, you've got a greater occipital nerve or GON, a third occipital nerve or TON, 
either one of those can get irritated and that can cause pain going up into the head or numbness and tingling at the back of the head. So realize that uh, just by having spasm in these muscles, you can get a quote occipital neuralgia. And then finally, the rectus capitis posterior minor jacks into the dura itself, the myodural bridge, and that can cause dural type headaches if that muscle jumps into overdrive. Hence, spasm in this area can lead to, as we talked about, poor position sense of the head on the neck, causing dizziness and balance, uh, activated occipital nerves, uh, or an irritated dura leading to headaches. And obviously, if this is being caused by spasm, then fixing the CCI or the instability is the solution, meaning the instability leads to these muscles to spasm, which then leads to all these other problems. So the most elegant way to fix this is to fix the instability. Now, obviously you can also treat these secondary problems. So you could do things like platelet lysate, hydrodissection, the occipital nerves under ultrasound guidance to see if you can help that occipital neuralgia uh, others would inject high dose steroids there, but that can damage uh, the structures. So we don't do that that way. You can also retrain the subaccipital muscles to try to provide better position sense information. And that retraining can be done with other neurologic things like moving the eyes while you're moving the neck, et cetera. Um, now, those don't necessarily really take uh, into account the treatment of the primary problem, which is usually instability, but they can help. So that's all I have for today. Let me go and see if we've got any questions here. And I'm just going to stop sharing this here. And then we will go see what we got in the way of questions here. Looks like we have a couple. Uh, Regenix been advanced by John. Hydrocentinal puffiness around vagus nerve and collarbone on one side after my bulge disc and C5-6 and the correlation on why this might be. Yeah, I mean, puffiness in here in the scalene triangle is usually due to tightness in the scalene muscles. That can be secondary to what you're describing. Um, in addition to that, um, usually not related to a problem in the vagus nerve. So uh, what you're describing is pretty common in patients who have thoracic outlet syndrome or tightness in the scaling triangle or the scaling muscles. AT, can sternum instability play a role in CCI due to muscle attachments to the neck? Uh, if so, how significant could that be? Um, yeah, more sternoclavicular. We see a lot of patients with sternoclavicular laxity, and that sternoclavicular laxity problems in the sternocleidomastoid muscles. And um, so that's generally what we tend to see there, uh, not so much uh, attachments in the sternum uh, itself, but more the sternoclavicular joint with the origin of the sternocleidomastoid muscles that go up this way. Uh, spin advanced by John Gardner, eye flutters and dizziness after bulge disc of 5.6 is typically resolved on its own once the disc heals. Usually eye flutters and dizziness don't have anything, <clears throat> anything at all to do with the C5.6 disc. If those are neck related, they're usually upper cervical related issues uh, having nothing to do with a 5.6 disc. I think you have to be really careful by the time we get to be 35 or 40, um, a large segment of people without any symptoms at all are going to have a C5-6 disc bulge. So having a C5-6 disc bulge on your MRI, if you've got any age on you at all, is super common and normal. Uh, the question is whether or not that 5-6 disc bulge is causing symptoms. And in order to do that, you've got to take a history from the patient. In this case, that history wouldn't match a 5-6 disc bulge. So what would match a 5-6 disc bulge? Uh, numbness and tingling in the thumb. 
uh, might match that. Pain in the immediate upper back here might match that. Obviously, lower neck pain might match that. But normally, uh, dizziness and visual issues, if they're going to be caused by the neck, are caused by the upper neck, not the lower neck. Uh, K. Benji, uh, are occipital muscles usually injected with PRP or prolotherapy or to help instability? No, um, you're not going to really get much out of injecting those occipital muscles directly. Now, we certainly, if they've got tendinopathy, we can inject the muscle tendons for sure. Um, and sometimes that can help the, the tendinopathy component to calm down. Uh, Regenics been advanced by John Gartner. What's the best sleeping position for a bulge disc and CCS symptoms? Uh, that is too variable for me to give you advice on. AT, uh, are there any downsides to strong supplementation of taking natural anti-inflammatory supplements post-PICL because uh, we would want that inflammation more initially? Yeah, I mean, if you're taking things like fish oil or uh, curcumin, I think that's fine. Uh, those operate at the LOX pathway, not the COX pathway. Um, so I don't think we're gonna, you're going to really move the needle much on needed uh, or required healing inflammation. Mark, a bulging disc at four and five. Both bulging discs have annular tears. This area is unstable despite several DVD procedures where the disc bulges and their annular tears be causing instability. Would a PRP intradiscal procedure stabilize the area? We need to have cultured stem cells. My understanding is that PRP intradiscal could treat the antler tears, but culture stem cells would be needed to treat the disc bulges. Um, yeah, so uh, it certainly, well, so if you're having disc pain, which is usually in a patient uh, under the age of 55 or so, who has quite a bit of difficulty sitting, and in that particular case, uh, then you might consider getting the disc injected. Now, as far as disc pain, uh, leukocyte rich, very high dose, 20 times baseline or 20 X PRP can make a difference. Uh, when it comes to trying to get rid of a disc bulge, we'd wanna make sure that that disc bulge was causing the symptom, in which case, or the symptoms, in which case then you could pursue something like Regenix C down in Grand Cayman in order to try to treat that disc Bulge. Regenix, some advanced by JA. Please remind me of how long one needs to avoid anti inflammatory meds following PRP injections. Well, you don't want to reduce in any way, shape, or form the acute inflammatory response. So at least three or four weeks, depending on the patient. Uh, probably you can get away with restarting them more quickly in younger patients and in older patients who have more prolonged inflammatory responses. You're going to want to wait at least a month or so. Uh, and then, yeah, I wouldn't use them on a day-to-day -day basis. I would use anti-inflammatory medicines like natural anti-inflammatory drugs just on a very intermittent basis when things are very bad. And of all the different natural anti-inflammatory drugs you could return to, uh, naproxen or Aleve has the lowest cardiac sudden death side effect, meaning all natural anti-inflammatory drugs increase your risk of, of getting a fatal heart attack or stroke by a good amount. Now, the good news is Aleve only increases that by about 80%. So if the risk is low, it got 80% higher. But by the time we get to things like Celebrex, we're talking about a three to four X increase in your risk uh, of dying from a fatal heart attack or stroke while on the medication. So if you're gonna go back to any one, leave uh, would probably be the best, all things being equal. Uh, AT, are there any specific pillars or sleep positions you would recommend more so after PSCL or CCI patients in general? No, that's very, very individual. So I always tell patients to try multiple different types of pillows, um, just in sleeping positions to try to find one that works for them. But there's no specific recommendations for CCI patients. Russian, how do you treat uh, lumbar disc tears? Do you have a high success treating that? 
Um, sure, yeah. If they're symptomatic, they can be treated with intradiscal, really intraannular, uh, x-ray guided and contrast confirmed uh, injection of either leukocyte rich, high dose PRP or bone marrow concentrate. If we're trying to treat a disc bulge, then that's more the, the cultured, uh, especially cultured cells down in Grand Cayman. Regenix, I'm in advance by DB, you know, the test or exam that can diagnose a serious inflammatory issue that is not MCAS or allergy. I don't, I mean, you, there's lots of inflammatory tests out there or blood tests, things like high sensitivity CRP or HSCRP is a good one. Looking for inflammation, you can get very specific and look at uh, inflammatory cytokines. Uh, things like interleukin uh, 6 or 8, but those are very, very specific tests of the ones that are, are widely available. High sensitivity CRP would be a good one, or HSCRP. Thin, uh, would well develop subacceptable muscles and other muscles contribute to stabilizing the upper cervical at night, or is the muscle's mass eventually worthless at night when the muscles are turned off? Yeah, you're not going to get a lot of protective effect from the suboccipitals at night because in most people, they'll be turned off. Now, they'll have a certain basal tone. So if they're atrophied, you're going to be, have more problems, but they're not as protective at night as they would be during the day when they're weight-bearing. Russian, what markers should I be looking for in my blood work that make MSK pain worse? Um, no specific markers. We, I think we just talked a little bit about the concept of blood markers for inflammation, uh, high sensitivity or HSCRP is a good one. There's some very, very specific ones out there, but those tend to be not widely available or harder to get insurance to pay for. Um, so HSCRP, uh, would be a good one. Um, ultimately, um, it's maybe far easier to get rid of the metabolic syndrome because we know metabolic syndrome can be associated with this. That means getting down to your 18 or 20 year old weight. Uh, that means uh, trying to be as active as you are able. Uh, that means uh, staying away from high sugar diets or complex carbohydrate diets and going to low sugar uh, diets, um, things like that tend to be more reliable ways to get rid of systemic inflammation um, than trying to play the blood test game. Thin, uh, when the capsule ligaments are injected with PRP, would cartilage benefit too? Again, um, just to make sure, and I think we've had this conversation quite a bit, that is uh, when doctors are describing they're injecting, quote, caps or ligaments, it's usually BS, meaning that it kind of just means that they're putting the needle in the vicinity of where the kind of joint lives, sort of. And it's not really an injection into the capsule around that facet joint. Now, if you were getting an X-ray uh, or fluoroscopically guided injection, into the facet joint, and they were also trying to hit the facet joint capsule, so that's gonna be a fluoroscopically guided contrast confirmed procedure, um, then you would get both. You would get inside the joint and the cartilage as well as getting the facet capsule. But when a doctor starts pulling that terminology, oh, I inject the facet capsules, it's usually BS. They're not even close to the facet capsules at all. It's just a euphorism for, I don't really know how to inject the joint. I was never trained to do that. I don't have the proper equipment for that. So I'll just tell the patient that that's what I'm injecting. But all I'm really doing is kind of putting the needle somewhere in the vicinity of where that structure lives. I don't know if I'm injecting it or not. Uh, it's been advanced by Harry Winston. Hoping you stay safe in the big hurricane heading to the U.S. We need you. Big hurricane. I think I'm pretty far away from the big hurricane, right? I think there was one headed towards Florida. Not not going to Florida anytime soon, so <laughs> hopefully I'm good, unless there's something headed for Colorado that I don't know about. Um, so if there's something headed for Colorado, put it in the comments, but I, I think I'm good there. Um, so thank you for your concern. Uh, Finn is supposed to your cervical PRP treatment standardized across Regenix providers, for example, injection sites and PRP uh, preparation. 
um, for a Regenix provider to be listed on our website as a spine provider, they have to have the ability to inject the joint under x-ray guidance. Um, and so that would be standardized across the Regenix network. Now that's gonna be C2 through T1. It's not gonna be one, two, it's not gonna be zero, one. That's a Colorado only thing. Um, so you would want to check the Regenix website to see if that person is listed as spine certified by Regenix. If they're not listed as spine certified by Regenix and are offering spinal treatments, that's an important thing for us to know because that's something that could potentially get them kicked off the network. I Meaning we don't tolerate doctors who have not been trained in advanced spine randomly injecting the neck um, and not doing it with that level. Now, we just looked at this three, four weeks ago. Uh, we did an audit on the website to try to make sure that all of that was, uh, all of that was accurate, meaning that uh, if we listed somebody as spine certified, they had advanced training to use x-ray uh, or fluoroscopic guidance with contrast confirmation to get into those facet joints, for example. Uh, if they didn't have that training and somehow they got listed like that on the website, we, we took them off. So we periodically go through and call all that to make sure it's, it's as accurate as possible. So uh, if you see someone who's not listed there, so go find your provider and make sure that they're listed that way. Obviously, if they are, that's all good. If they're not, but they're offering to inject your neck facet capsules, then let us know because that person um, will have a problem with us. Diana, even though MRI shows fatty infiltration in neck and muscle atrophy, can we still build cervical muscle and gain the strength back? Yeah, that's a very good question and a topic I didn't really cover in this quick discussion on suboccipital muscles, Diana, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, as many people know, those suboccipital muscles can atrophy, and I think I pointed out uh, that a couple times on MRI. So those muscles kind of shrink up. And uh, we don't know, and no one really knows yet, whether you can get them back once they shrink up like that. You know, that original research was done by Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim was one of our physical therapists back in the day. He went back and got a PhD in Australia and then ended up as a professor at Northwestern in Chicago and has done a really the seminal research in understanding that a lot of folks after neck injury who have headaches, including the patient population that I deal with a lot, cranial cervical instability patients, have atrophy of those muscles. So no one's sure yet if they can be brought completely back. We obviously all hope they can be. Diana, can TMJ injections help hold the disc in the right spot? Do you inject ligaments around the TMJ joint? Uh, yes, Diana, uh, I inject the ligaments around the TMJ joint uh, as well as the joint itself. As far as holding the disc in the right spot, uh, that should occur as a natural part of stabilizing the joint. But you also need to realize that at the end of the day, we don't necessarily know that some of these things that we report on MRI like the, the disc being out of place on uh, opening and closing are associated with pain. And we need to be a little careful with some of that stuff because uh, we have a lot of things we see on MRI that could be very normal for that person, meaning, you know, could be present in a lot of people that don't have any pain at all. So we always need to be careful when we're looking at that concept. Um, and the disc coming in and out when you open and close your mouth is one of those concepts that no one is sure that that's all that critically important in patients that have TMJ pain, even though it's reported on MRIs. Mark, uh, my L4 and L5 vertebra are tipping and twisting. They're only painful when they're out of position. Can that be caused by a bulging disc causing instability? Could the annular tears cause instability there? Traveling Grand Cayman like this would be going to be possible for me. So I'm trying to decide if I should do PRP intradiscal here. Yeah, so if you've done a, a full functional spinal unit, platelet uh, DDD procedure, where 
the ligaments have been injected, uh, the atrophied muscles have been injected, the facet joints have been injected, any nerve irritation areas have had transforaminal epidurals done, meaning those four injections simultaneously constitute a DDD procedure. So if you've had that and you're still having instability at that level, then the next step to consider uh, once you understand the risks and benefits would be injecting the disc. Uh, and leukocyte rich PRP 20X, very, very, very high concentration would be a very, very reasonable next step. Assuming you understand what the risks and benefits of all that are, as I always tell patients, there's about a one in 300 chance of discitis. Discitis means an infection or an uncontrolled infection within the disc where we upset the bacterial balance within the disc. And that would mean uh, usually a disc surgery to wash it out, plus IV antibiotics. Now that's not a high chance. I quote one in 300. Others have said I'm quoting it too high. It's maybe one in 1200. Obviously in talking to patients, I'd rather quote the higher risk rather than the lower risk, and then have them make the decision. Diana, any more info on the mechanism of how TMJ injection strength in the joint? My jaw deviates and can't open mouth, and I feel like my face is so loose and falling off. But it'll be through tightening ligaments, so that would be the goal there. Obviously, just realize that there's a lot of crosstalk between what's happening in the jaw and the upper cervical spine. So treating one may require treating the other. All right, I'm one month post PICL, flare is pretty severe at this point. Can I try to ice to reduce some of the pain? Something symptoms are especially bad right now. Sure, you can definitely ice. So Laura, that means you're definitely in that fragile egg uh, category where you've got central sensitization, um, which is usually associated with that systemic inflammation. So that's important for us to know, obviously, because it means that uh, if we do any second or subsequent procedure, we're gonna have to go extremely slow, meaning uh, less will be more. And a uh, very important thing for us to understand. Now, since you're about a month out, you could also, you know, one of the things that a lot of patients do is we take them off a lot of things, right, uh, after, before their PICL. So if they were on low-dose naltrexone, they got off of that. If they were on natural anti-inflammatory drugs, they got off of those. So since you're a month out and you're, you're beyond that normal acute inflammatory area, you could start restart those medications if you got off of them before so that we could get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because I find that a lot of times... Uh, it's not so much the procedural flare, but the fact that people were, uh, in a way, addicted to these medications to function, and we took them off prior to the procedure. So that's something else to consider. Uh, KBEN, are the local state located where genetics locations trained to form C0 to C2 injections posteriorly, or the upper cervical injections only performed in Colorado location? They are not trained to perform C0 of C2 by Regenix at all. Uh, we don't train anyone in high upper cervical work. We never have uh, and probably never will. Uh, so that means that those are Colorado only injections. Now that doesn't mean that we uh, don't have doctors out there, few and far between, who do a reasonable number of those and they may believe that their skills are competent and up to snuff and they've got the right equipment like digital subtraction and geography to give it a go. But I don't recommend any of them uh, at this juncture. The only recommendation I'll make is that that patient come to Colorado uh, to get that done. And that's based on what I've talked about before. And that is to do any procedure competently and certainly a high risk procedure like that You've got to do it enough where you feel extremely confident in your skills. And that means that you're doing it a lot. You're doing it um, at the very least 50 to 100 times a year. Uh, you, uh, that means that you are uh, able to deal with all sorts of crazy little anatomical quirks that people have or not being able to get in this position or that position you're able to interpret 
all the different ways that contrast dye might flow. You've got access to digital subtraction and geography, um, all of those things to try to keep the patient safe. Uh, and again, 50 to 100 a year of C0, C1 is rarefied air. We've got, you know, probably only a tiny collection of doctors in the entire country that do that, those procedures 50 times a year. Uh, and uh, almost none outside of Colorado that would do them 100 times a year. And in my practice alone, I'm doing them a couple hundred times a year with about a, a four or 5,000 deep experience base. So again, just be very careful there. Russian, how do, we, how do we put any patients, or have you put patients on BPC? Yeah, no, I don't. Because if you look at the BPC 157 data, I think it's 157, not 175. Uh, it doesn't look any better than sort of a weak PRP. Um, so it doesn't make much sense to me to play that game. Plus, I've got no clue whether or not anything I buy online actually has BPC-157 in it, uh, meaning, you know, you're not buying these things from really reputable places. Um, you know, you're buying them from a place behind, you know, the, the big O tires in Memphis, Tennessee or whatever. Um, I mean, we're not talking about re reputable compounding pharmacies that are buying research grade stuff that are regulated heavily by the FDA and their state pharmacy boards. Um, none of that applies here. It's kind of the wild, wild west. Herd mentality 101, how often have you performed a repeat PICL and have it been more successful than initial treatment? Uh, how many repeat PICLs, meaning second PICLs? Um, a lot, so uh, let's see. So, so far, we've done about 1,200 procedures. Of those, I would say several hundred um, would have been second PICLs. And uh, as far as are they more successful than initial treatment, sometimes they can be, sometimes uh, similar results to the, the first treatment. Uh, Russian, uh, how or does red light therapy help with healing symptomatic discs or ligaments. Not based on any data, high level data of which I'm aware. Um, I don't think it's bad to try it, but I, I wouldn't hang my hat on it. Uh, Grace, how to see had a great PSA number two, you treated both my shoulders as well. Unfortunately, for the first time ever, I tested positive for COVID last Thursday. I think I'm on the mend now. Is it still possible to get results PSA even though having COVID or will it likely negatively impact the procedure? Also, a strange symptom started. I have pain, numbness, and tingling in my left upper arm. If I try to raise the arm, is something I should be worried about. Um, not something to be worried about, although you may want to work with a physical therapist on thoracic outlet on that side, which is pretty common in CCI patients. Um, listen, based on the March 2023 study out of Switzerland, the Omicron variant was about as virulent as influenza A and B. Uh, there was a 1.5x increased likelihood of ending up or of mortality, meaning only 150% influenza A or B. So you've basically got something that's about as virulent right now as the flu, and that was Omicron. Uh, it would be expected that this year's variants would be less virulent than that because that's been the overall uh, confirmed trend in the peer-reviewed literature. So I wouldn't worry any worry anymore about being COVID positive as I would getting the flu. Um, uh, that's what the peer reviewed data currently says. Um, if you take all the politics and insanity out of it, um, so if you want, uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to send you that uh, Swiss study from the Swiss healthcare system. So uh, we're dealing with the flu right now. Uh, so if you're not concerned about testing positive for the flu. I wouldn't worry about testing positive for COVID. Diana, thank you for everything. Sure, Diana. Uh, Brendan, uh, Dr. Tanner, do you think it's beneficial to have some scar tissue surrounding the area of a ligament injury, or should you try to diminish it with something like uh, serapeptase? Uh, well, scar tissue is how ligaments heal. So, in the healing of any fibrous tissue, what happens is you first lay down disorganized tissue and that 
is otherwise called scar tissue. And then with loading and remodeling, that scar tissue turns into tendon or ligament tissue that's aligned. So there's nothing wrong with initially laying down disorganized tissue. That's how we all heal. Uh, K-Ben, can you please explain how the geometric math is calculated when measuring the distance as it relates to ensuring that the vertebral artery is not injected during a prolotherapy procedure? Geometric math. Um, well, so let's go over, let's unpack that a little bit here, K-Ben. The first thing is when it comes to a prolotherapy procedure, um, the doctors really aren't all that concerned about hitting the vertebral artery. So that's one of the reasons, meaning I'd say 60, 70% of all neck prolotherapy would be done blind. Do I think that's you know, a good way to do it in 2023? No, I think it's below the standard of care. And one of the reasons it's below the standard of care is you could park a needle inadvertently into the vertebral artery, inject a prolotherapy solution into that artery and kill or really harm somebody. Um, and then you get into how to avoid injecting into the vertebral artery. Uh, that would be, you could use ultrasound guidance, but that's not going to be the best way to do it. Uh, you'd want to use contrast confirmed fluoroscopy with digital subtraction and geography, which is really not done in a prolotherapy procedure at all. So I'm not quite sure what geometric math means in this context. But I can tell you that during a prolotherapy procedure, they're really not um, really not doing much of anything for the most part in trying to make sure they don't inadvertently inject the vertebral artery. Uh, but you need to. Regenix, uh, it's been advanced by DB. It would cause the sensitization you, or centralization, maybe, or sensitization you've talked about. Are there other causes and the use of substance like cannabis or drugs. I think we're talking about here central sensitization. So that means that that person um, has a uh, overreaction to painful stimuli. And that overreaction has become pathologic uh, and, it, and it really um, causes lots of problems. So what are some of the causes of that? Uh, metabolic syndrome in the U.S. is a huge one, meaning uh, as we gain weight. So if you're not at your 25-year-old weight um, and you're you know, more than 10 or 20 pounds overweight, and uh, then and you're, as you get older, and especially if you're not very active, you've got the risk of uh, getting metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome increases systemic inflammation which is going to increase the likelihood of getting central sensitization. Another thing would be uh, long-term issues uh, that irritate nerves that get just are left untreated uh, or poorly treated. Uh, and then another one would be actual neurologic injury that is not showing up on MRI. So for example, I think we talked about the use of diffusion tensor imaging to try to see if uh, normal MRIs were associated with uh, damage within the spinal cord, for example. Uh, and that's a, a fancy type of MRI to see if there is uh, damage within the spinal cord that could cause something like central sensitization. So those are three different examples. Thatchet, are neck isometrics considered good to try, rebuild some of those stuff except muscles Isometrics are more of the big muscles. Um, certainly, if you can't tolerate movement, then isometrics is the first step. Then you would need to do some movement uh, in order to get to the point where you actually are building some muscles. So isometrics would be the first step in getting in that direction of trying to strengthen those, those muscles. Uh, uh, Stacy, how does prolotherapy or PRP help an ankle lower leg muscle that has atrophied collapse? Stacy, I would need to know more about what muscle we're talking about there. Jeremy, uh, would low testosterone impact tissue remodeling and outcome after a cervical procedure? 
Um, I don't know that I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that at this juncture. I think you could probably get a lot of people who do testosterone supplementation in their practice who would argue that it's critical. Um, having said that, um, we don't really see that um, practically. So, for example, uh, we did a study that re remains unpublished to this day, uh, although it took a lot of time to do, and we optimized testosterone and thyroid in a bunch of men. We took a bone marrow sample before we optimized them, a bone marrow sample after we optimized them, and then we grew both of them out and did tests in those cells. We didn't find um, that testosterone improved in any way, shape, or form the mesenchymal stem cell performance in those bone marrow samples. So that study kind of told me that it's probably not important for healing if it's not helping your mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, maybe you can get below a threshold where it then becomes important, but amping it up in middle age to older men didn't seem to make a darn bit of difference with when it came to making their stem cells healthier in the study that we did. Okay, uh, I think I'm out of questions here. So if there are any other questions, this is a last call for questions. Uh, any other questions I can answer, type them in. What we talked about today uh, was suboccipital muscles and how they're involved in proprioception or position sense of the head on the neck, how they help to stabilize the head on the neck, and how they can spasm if you've got instability to try to help stabilize the neck. In addition to that, you've got umpteen nerves that run through here. So those nerves can get irritated when that spasm happens, causing headache. And then also um, some of those muscles jack into the dura or covering of the spinal cord and brain, which is going to lead to other issues uh, in of itself. Uh, herd mentality. How often do CCI patients have leg neuropathy? Um, uh, as far as leg symptoms of numbness and tingling, I would say pretty common, but a lot of that, a lot of times there's a separately developed low back issue causing that that needs to be treated. Um, not always. So, um, so if that's what you're referring to, we see that quite a bit. Russia, how do you feel pain? How do you feel pain in your body? Are you dealing with any issues, pain? Sure, yeah, I'm an, I'm an aging weekend warrior. So I, I have all sorts of aches and pains. I tell you one of the things that tends to reduce those aches and pains is, is when my weight's under better control. Uh, hence that whole conversation about uh, metabolic syndrome from before. SG, I don't remember what ankle muscle. She is in a boot, 68, and both are stabilizing, doesn't work. She would need surgery on the muscle. Yeah, I would need to know more there. Uh, Jeremy, uh, what about high blood pressure's impact on a procedure? Mildly elevated, say 130 to 140 range. Probably not an issue uh, as far as healing is concerned. Obviously, that's something you want to discuss with your family doctor, cardiologist, et cetera. Um, I can tell you that certain blood pressure medications like ACE inhibitor medications, for instance, lisinopril, can um, hurt mesenchymal stem cells. That's something we've seen for years now. Uh, Ken, uh, K. Benji, uh, what is the current wait time for a PICL procedure, consultation procedure? Um, probably booking out into November right now, somewhere, somewhere in there. Okay, guys, so I think I'm at, that's my last question. Um, we're at 145, my time. So I'll give it uh, just a few more uh, minutes to see if any other questions come in. Uh, let's see, just some housekeeping. I will be here uh, this Friday. And then I think that following that next Monday is Labor Day. So I'll probably be taking Labor Day off. Uh, and then, um, just to give you an idea of when I'll be here and, and what I'm doing. Uh, and then as I have uh, said before, I'm going uh, out for six weeks starting September 15th through October 30th. Uh, during that time, I will do weekly uh, Facebook Lives like this 
or I'll pre-record something, uh, put it out there uh, so that people can ask questions on Facebook, et cetera, and, um, and you know, continue to have content going out there. Again, I do these things uh, partly to try to get a new topic out there and educate, and also partly to make sure that people have a forum to get their questions answered. Um, as you might imagine, I'm a busy physician, so I, I answer, I don't know, maybe 100, 50 to 100 patient emails a week. Um, and I also answer questions here, uh, if I can, twice a week, uh, because I want people to have the ability and access to uh, get those questions answered, because I find that patients who uh, get their questions answered, are much less anxious about procedures. I find that patients who get their questions answered are obviously much more knowledgeable. They're much more likely to get better. They know and understand what's happening to them. And obviously anyone that under understands what's happening to them is going to be somebody who is just in general going to do better because they know what to expect. They know what's coming down the pike um, and they know what a good question is and how to distill information to put uh, what they're looking for into just a few words. So that's the reason why I do these things, uh, try to make myself available. So I will be here this coming uh, Friday and then again off for Labor Day. So it looks like questions have petered out for now. I want to uh, wish everyone a great week and I will see you uh, this coming Friday. Thank you much.